Easter is one of those times of the year where uh, people who don't come to church except for two times a year will come to church, right? And those two times a year are Christmas and Easter. And so for Easter, it is one of those times where uh, churches, uh, and especially here at Pantano, we want to do everything that we can to help uh, anyone who is far from Jesus know that God loves them. Right, And so uh, we do a lot of planning. We do a lot of um, different things to, to prep for that. But the thing about um, Easter is that because of man's sin and being broken and falling away from, from relationship with God, we needed Easter to remind us and, and to show us how to get back to God. And so it's one of those things that in Christianity is one of our pillar uh, holidays. It is one of our pillar moments throughout the year of a relationship with God. But for us to fully and completely understand and grasp Easter and the meaning of Easter and and what it means to uh, us as Christians and to people in general and to all of history, we really have to go back to the very beginning of time, right? We have to go back to the beginning of the Bible. We have to go back to creation and we have to uh, look at how everything started so that we can get a full picture on why we celebrate Easter. And so for us to get started tonight, we're jumping back into the beginning of Scripture, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, and Genesis is the very beginning of the Bible. And in the beginning, uh, in Genesis 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on to tell us how God created all of the things, right? And so the frame here is like God, right? God is here, and he is creating, and he's, he's putting all the pieces together, and He creates and he puts light and it's like he's putting a big piece in there. And then he creates uh, darkness and he puts another piece in there and then land and then water and then all of the things, the trees and and all of the dirt and all of the different things. And then he begins to put the the very specific pieces in there, right? And he goes with the birds. And I, I, I don't know about you and I know Eric is a big fan of birds, but I'm not a huge fan of birds. But God created birds and he puts birds in there and then he jumps to animals and he puts animals in there and he does fish and he puts fish in there and then uh, all of it is held together because God's fingerprints are all over it because it was it was out of God's mind out of God's words that he created everything that is and then on the sixth day God creates man and woman he creates Adam and Eve and he looks at creation and it tells us in Genesis 1.31, it says, Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. Now, the thing about everything being very good is that we have this definition of good as something that's slightly better than something else, right? Like, you know what? I like bubblegum ice cream. It is good compared to strawberry ice cream. Yes, I'm like a five-year-old who likes bubblegum ice cream. All right, let that go. You know, and then it's like, you know what? Uh... I am, I'm okay at basketball. And so my son compared to me, he's good, right? It's these things. Yeah, he's 10. Again, don't, don't mock, just let it be. And so uh, we have this definition of good that is slightly better than something else. But the truth is the definition of good when it says that in the Bible means that it is exactly the way that God created it to be. And so when God looks at creation... He's saying that creation is the exact way that it should be because only in relationship with God can anything reach its potential. And so when he looks at creation, when he looks at all the pieces fitting together and the perfect outlook of what creation is, he looks at it and says it's good. And it's good because it's in proper relationship with him. And just like this mirror is held together by the frame keeping it in place, All of creation, whether that was the plants or the animals or humanity, was all good because it was held in place by relationship to God. And so God looks at man and he looks at woman and he says, enjoy paradise. I only have one command for you. And there's a tree, it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Just don't eat from that tree. 
You can, you can eat from any tree that you want to eat from. You know what? If you want to go swim with the dolphins, go swim with the dolphins. You know what? If you want to wrestle with the lions, go wrestle with the lions. You can do anything in creation that you want to do. Just don't eat from this one tree. And so into this perfection comes the villain. In chapter 3, verses 1 through, four, well, 1 through 5, it says this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, here's the deal, right? So, um, we know that it says serpent right there, but we also know uh, from, from Christianity, Christian history and from church history that it's not simply just the serpent. It's also the devil. And so, we're not exactly sure how they worked together in this. But we know that it was more than just an animal approaching, uh, approaching Eve when this happens. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals. Anybody who knows how to define the word shrewd after this, come find me because that will be an amazing thing for me to learn. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. One day, one day he asked, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden. Now, the thing about that is, that statement right there is a twist on what God told them. It was a twist because God said they could eat from any tree. But what happens is, the enemy takes the truth and twists it. What we have to understand about any temptation is that temptation takes something good and twists it. God said they could do whatever they wanted. God said they could go wherever they wanted. They could could be whoever they wanted. The only stipulation he said was, don't eat from one tree. But the enemy says, God told you you couldn't eat from any tree. Let's keep going in in chapter 3. Verse 2, it says, Uh, Eve answers back to him and says, of course we may eat from, from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It is only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. I love this, right? Eve is like, I'm not messing around with this. The truth is, God said we can eat from any tree with the exception of one. And so the way to battle temptation is with truth, right? When the temptation is, you know what? I'm going to place my identity in a person. The truth is that no one person is ever going to fulfill us. When, when, uh, when temptation says, you know what? I really like chocolate cake. And so I'm going to eat an entire chocolate cake. You know what? One piece of chocolate cake's okay because it's like heaven, right? Like good chocolate cake is amazing. Some of you are like, I don't like chocolate cake. Well, just go with me on it. One piece is okay. An entire cake is not, right? And so that's temptation. Temptation is to take something good and twist it or make it bigger than it should be. And so in verse four, the serpent answers back. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What happens here is that doubt begins to creep in. The test was not, could she verbally spar with the serpent? The test was, do you trust God or do you not trust God? And so the seed of doubt was planted, like we're talking about fruit and like the seed of doubt. The seed of doubt was planted in her mind. And so she had to wonder, can I trust God? Do I really trust that God has my best interest at heart? And so what happens, what happens is that she begins to process it and dwell on it and think about it. And she begins to wrestle with it. And she begins uh, to then say, well, maybe, maybe, you know what? I don't need all of the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe just a little bit. And so she takes the fruit. And then she hands some to Adam. 
and they eat. Now the question is, why would God even put that tree there in the first place? You guys thought something was about to happen, didn't you? Why would you put that tree there in the first place? Well, the fact is, God is a loving father who doesn't want robots. God doesn't want you to follow him just to follow him because you have to. If God had said, you know what, uh, Adam and Eve, you can go into creation and you can do whatever you want. And there was, there was no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It would have been like God taking pets and putting them into a nice uh, like aquarium. I'm thinking of an ant farm. And God would have been like, hey, look at the ants. That's so pretty. But God doesn't want ants. God doesn't want pets. God wants a relationship with each one of us, a real relationship. And so the thing was, God put that tree there because he gave them something. And it was huge. And it was called choice. Because that way they chose to have relationship with him. They chose to keep God as the one who brought life to everything. And it was through that choice that relationship was established. And that's where we are today also. God doesn't want to force you to have relationship with him. Even though a relationship with God is the one relationship that will define you, the one relationship that will help you have purpose, the one relationship that will help you be who you were created to be, God's not going to force that on you because God doesn't want you to be a robot. God wants, to, wants each one of us as unique human beings to be in real relationship with him. He doesn't want all of us to be the same and he doesn't want all of us to act the same. He wants, he wants you with all of your gifts and talents and abilities to choose to follow him. And so what we see is Eve takes the fruit and she hands it to Adam. And they take a bite. And in that moment, Creation was shattered. The perfect image of what God created was done. It meant that what was, was no more. It meant, it meant, it meant that creation, that everything that was, that was held in sway by relationship with God was broken because man and woman decided that they would put themselves in the place of God, that they would put themselves in the place of saying, I'm going to decide what's right. I'm going to decide what's good. I'm going to decide what's amazing. Instead of seeing everything as it should be, we now take the shards of this world and we shape our lives around them. We take these little pieces of glass and instead of seeing the big picture of who God created you to be in the world and how you fit in the world, what, what we do now is we take a little sliver of glass, we take a little sliver of the relationship with God and we say, this is who I am. But God doesn't intend you to be this. God intend you, intended you to see the entire picture and how you fit in the entire picture. Instead of a world held in place through relationship with God, we have only a broken, distorted image. Right now, when we look at this mirror, like some of you can still see, see part of the reflection, but some of you can only see the broken part. Have you ever looked at yourself in a broken mirror? It's like there's multipl multipliers of you, or you see like just specks of the whole. And so we live in a world that no longer saw the whole picture or what it was created to be. It sees itself as a broken, distorted image. And we use those broken pieces to give us an identity. The thing was, when when humanity decided that they would put themselves in the place of God, they aren't God. 
And so they didn't have the power to put it all back together. Like right now, if I was to start picking up these pieces, let's hope I don't cut myself, picking up these pieces and like fitting them back in this frame, even if I picked up as many pieces as I can see and I jumped down here and, and pick up the pieces that shattered down here and, and I went over here and I got them all, even if I picked up every piece, there would still be some fragments, there would still be some dust, there would still be something that would not make it complete. And so with that on a theological level, Man was left hopeless. Humanity was left hopeless because it couldn't put itself back together. It couldn't fit the whole picture back together. In the New Testament in Romans 5, it says this. When Adam sinned, when Adam sinned sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So what we have to understand is that Adam and Eve were our, were our um, great, great exponential grandparents. And so when they sinned, it entered this, this like disease of sin through all of us. And it was passed down. And, and my son, who's 10, and, and, and we were talking about the story of Adam and Eve and creation and, and the Garden of Eden and all these things. And we were talking about it. And he's like, man, dad, I'm pretty angry at Adam and Eve. And I was like, why is that, buddy? And he's like, because they screwed it up for the rest of us. And I was like, well, let me ask you a question. And I'll ask you the same. How many of you have ever told a lie? How many of you, keep your hand up, how many of you have ever taken something that didn't belong to you? How many of you have thought negatively about someone? Right now, everybody's hand is up, and if it's not right now, you're thinking negatively of me because I'm calling you out. You can put your hands down. The truth is, when it comes to sin, even if Adam and Eve had not screwed it up for us, we would have screwed it up along the way. Because at some point, we would have said, I can do it better than God. Because we've seen that in our lives. We do that all the time. And so sin entered the world through one man. And what we have to understand about sin is there's tons of different definitions. There's tons of different ways of looking at it. But the thing about sin is that sin is putting anything in the place of God. Sin is putting anything in the place of God. And this means allowing anything other than God to define us. This means putting anything other than God in that top spot. And it says that sin, that in, in 12 again... It says that death spread, Adam's sin brought death. And so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Death entered through sin. Because what we have to understand is that in the Garden of Eden, the way that God created everything was for it to be in relationship with him. And what we have to realize about God and relationship with God is that God brings life. That life is built and sustained through relationship with God. And so when scripture tells us that Adam brought in sin and sin brought in death, it's saying that, that creation, that everything was separated from God. And the problem with everything being separated from God, if God brings life, then it means that if you're separated from God, then you're slowly dying. Whether you die immediately or you die long term, you're dying. You ready for some hard truth? <laughs> if you've ever had someone close to you die, and there's a part of you that is like, this is not right. If you ever had a friend who's been too young that's been taken or has passed away, then 
And there's that part of you that says, this isn't right. Or you've ever had someone in your life who has suffered from a major disease and you have to watch them wasting away. And there's part of you that says, this isn't right. Well, here's the deep theology. You're right. It's not right. Because God intended for us to live forever. It means that when we feel that inside of us, it's that part of us that is the fingerprints of God still existing that says, you know what? We weren't created for this. We were created for something else. That's why death doesn't settle well with us. It's why disease doesn't settle well with us. Sin is why someone dying is hard because we weren't created to experience death. Because it's only in relationship with God that we have life. So humanity is left, is left hopeless and helpless with nothing. They are left to just wander and hope that they can find some meaning through the shards and through the fragments of what was once paradise. And we can look at our world and we see that today. This week in Nashville, kids getting shot. We see it around the world in war and famine and mistreatment. I guarantee you some of you saw it today in school when someone was being bullied or someone was being, uh, being marginalized. We can see that the world that we live in isn't right. And we're left to, we are left to try and grasp the shards of broken creation to give us meaning. And we look at these pieces and we think, we'll try to make it work. And there's no way for us to put the pieces back together. But just like if I was to grab one of these, one of these shards right here, when we try to fit our lives together through these pieces, it leaves us broken and bleeding. But there was hope. Because... Because the moment that creation was shattered, God put a plan in place. God put a plan in place and he waited till the perfect time. He waited till creation was at its perfect place. He waited until the exact moment in history. And then he instituted his plan. He brought Jesus on the scene. And Jesus who was born in a miraculous way, lived a perfect life. He lived a perfect life because he had to be the perfect sacrifice. And he lives a perfect life. And that doesn't mean uh, like it was perfection or that his life was perfect. What it means is in every aspect of his life, he found his identity in God. It meant in every aspect of his life that he put what God wanted ahead of him, of himself. That's Perfection. It means holding God in his proper spot. Holding God as the framework for our lives. Jesus was born to change history. Jesus was born to replace Adam. In Romans 5.15 it says this. For the sin of one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Jesus died as the perfect sacrifice. And Jesus took the place of Adam. Adam brought death, but Jesus brings life. In 518, it says this. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings right relationship with God and new life for everyone. And so Jesus opened the door for the mirror to be put back together. Jesus opened the door for us to not find identity in the shards of the mirror, but to find identity in the frame that holds it all together. 
Jesus opened the door for us to see the world as it should be. For us to live the life that we were created for. And that's with God holding it all together. And the truth is, we can look at the world and we know it's broken. And Jesus will come back one day. He will physically come back into the world and there will be a band that announces his coming. And he will redeem the world and he will make it into what it was meant to be and what it was created for. But when we surrender our lives to him and we get baptized, we are asking for God to help us live the life that we are created for. So this week, as we close in on Easter, we're going to be giving you a mirror. It's not one that is as big as this. But we want to give you a mirror to represent looking at a clear picture of a world held together by God. It's a little round mirror, but it's in a, in a plastic casing, so it has a frame. And when you look in that mirror, I want you to remember how much God loves you. And I want you to remember that the only way for you to be who you were created to be is to live within the frame of who God called you to be, and that's relationship with him. And that's finding meaning and purpose and life through him. And so this week I have three challenges for you. I want you to look in the mirror every day. Look in the mirror and remember how much God loves you. Because as we go into Easter, that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about the price that was paid and we're thinking about how much he loves us. The second challenge is to invite someone to come with you next week. We talked, about the, we talked about the setup for Easter tonight. We talked about the need for Easter tonight. Next week, we talk about living a life that is fully committed to who Jesus Christ is calling you to be. And then third, I mentioned that on Easter, Pantano will go to all links to reach everyone that shows up with the love of Jesus. Think about someone you can invite to come to Easter. The world that we live in is a broken image of what God created it. But God gives you the opportunity to begin living the life that you were meant for, the life that you were created for. Let that sink in tonight. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed to small groups. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for watching over us. Lord, help us to see that living in relationship with you brings true life. Let us focus as we go to small groups. Help our small group leaders to have the right words to help us know you. I love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.